Hello, hello guys, how are we doing? We're we doing good. We got now, we're here to talk about one of the most interesting um, developing technologies at the moment, it's of course blockchain. So let's have a show of hands. If you're truthful with yourself, who here genuinely believes they understand blockchain technology and the implementation? I'm glad we're all being honest with ourselves. Thankfully, these guys up on stage next, they absolutely do. So we're going to learn a lot about the past, the current as it's coming back up, and then, of course, the future of blockchain. We've got some great speakers. We've got Angel Versetti, co-founder, CEO of Amorosis, and he's an expert in blockchain technology and the youngest uh, member of the recent Forbes 30 Under 30. Um, and then we have Orr, who's um, the CTO of Iconic Holdings, which is a crypto asset management firm based in Germany. And finally, moderating, we have a fantastic Michael Gosiek, um, who's the founder of Truth Capital, and he's got so many ICOs under his belt. So give a nice, warm, star grind welcome to the blockchain guy. Let's go. Welcome, welcome. It wouldn't be a startup conference without a blockchain panel, so we're here to do the uh, obvious. Um, so who here actually owns crypto, just so we have a sense of the room? Who here owns any sort of blockchain currency? All right, not bad. Who has transacted in the last month with our blockchain currency? Okay, we got two, three. I mean, guys, if you guys are selling it, I mean, I think we're in spring, so I think that's a mistake. But we'll, we'll see what these guys think. Why don't we start there? Um, do you guys think we're in winter, in spring? Do you think things are on the right track? Are we going to head up for a boom or a bust? What do you think the sentiment of the market is right now? Are you talking sort of financially or are you talking for innovation-wise in startups? Because I think you can look mm -hmm. at it sort of from two perspectives, really. Leave it open to interpretation. <laughs> Why don't you answer as you see fit? <laughs> Fine. So I think financial, uh, I mean, I've been in the crypto space for about six years now. Um, I've seen highs, I've seen lows, um, and I think we're just going to continue seeing that happen because this is just the nature of a very speculative market. What's more interesting is the sort of attitude that you see around entrepreneurship and ventures being sort of developed and more serious use cases being introduced, which hopefully would lead to a wider adoption. I mean, I think you asked how many people have done transactions in the last uh, month or so, and we've seen only a handful of hands being raised. Um, I'd like to see a full audience sort of using blockchain, whether they know it or not, because you also have a lot of systems using blockchain in the background without our, us as regular consumers being aware of it. Mm -hmm. So there's a rise in the utility of blockchain. Um, so I don't see a crypto winter there, sure. uh, which is why we've also seen the market recover slightly. Yeah, and Angel, how would you describe uh, where you think the sort of industry as a whole is these days? Yeah, oh wow, sorry for that. Okay, so his is too, too soft and mine is too strong. Uh, I think that a lot of the big boys, not think, I know that a lot of the big boys are buying in. I hear myself for some reason. A, a lot of the big boys are buying in. So when you talk to banks or to financial institutions, they are actually saying, you know, crypto is illegal. A lot of people are getting their bank accounts shut down and so on. But at the same time, a lot of the largest asset management companies, whilst they're make it, making it borderline illegal for their clients to buy into crypto and make it impossible to do so, they're quietly buying in. So my expectation is that within the next 6 to 12 months, uh, Bitcoin will break the previous records. You think it's going to go past 20K? Yeah, uh, it'll break the previous records, I think, within the next 6 to 12 months. Mm -hmm. We're now financial advisors. We don't play them on the Internet. Um, but that being said, where are we in the, you know, now that's where the financial industry might be, but where are we in the actual infrastructure, where in the hype cycle are we? Is it, uh, you know, we, we've, I think we've kind of peaked a little bit in terms of the actual hype, and I think we're trying to get into a little bit of adoption, but what do you guys think? What is the thing that might be driving or hurting adoption in terms of the actual cycle of technology being implemented? Well, I think that the biggest topic on mind right now is global coin, Facebook's initiative to launch their own blockchain, right? Um, Big step from them, considering that around six months ago, they banned cryptocurrency talk entirely on their platform. It's like China banning uh, Silicon Valley's tech companies because they want to build their own. It's just the way this industry it seems to be working, right? One day you have one body saying no, the other day they're building their own blockchain and releasing their own coins and starting to trade, right? It's all about incentive. 
Part of it is due to regulation, to be honest. Um, that seems to be really sort of what staggers the full-on adoption, and I think that relates to what Angel said regarding bank accounts. Um, I know with my previous startup, Epified, back in 2014, getting a bank account in the UK was really, really hard for any fintech, actually, not just if it's blockchain, because the idea of creating sort of this new financial revolution is weird to institutions. They don't like that idea, so it's really hard to, to break through. But on top of that, the fault isn't only on them. The fault also relies on the companies themselves trying to do things a little bit out of the box too much sometimes. Sure. It kind of seems like technology is leading ahead of regulation. So in some ways, you kind of have to because the regulators aren't operating quickly enough, similar to Uber and in some cases, you know, even similar to social networks. Exactly. Uber are fighting like daily uh, regulations and different yeah. laws and jurisdictions to try and get themselves through. So, I mean, they have. We as consumers have adopted them. It probably will be the same with cryptocurrencies yeah. in the long run because uh, it's always in the hand of the consumers. Um, but it's up to the companies and their own responsibilities to sort of push and see it through in, in a right and, and sort of responsible manner. Sure. And so, Adriel, what do you think is hurting or helping adoption? Hurting or helping adoption? Either one. Uh, well, in terms of hurting, for sure, the uh, speculation and all the negative press that ICOs and cryptocurrencies have received in the past and are still receiving today, that definitely doesn't help. So we at Ambrosos, we actually build industrial solutions on top of blockchain. So we deal a lot with corporate stakeholders and governments. And of course, the amount of persuasion and education we have to do is tremendous. I mean, usually it starts as follows. We come to a corporate saying that we have a blockchain for IoT, blah, blah. And it's got a cryptocurrency in it. And they say, ah, so it's kind of like Bitcoin. So your drug dealers and terrorists money. And when the meeting with a corporate starts like that, then you have a long way to, you know, to go before you can persuade them to use your system. So from that perspective, all of this bad press is, of course, damaging to adoption. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and the other thing which I think is even more important, and it lies at the fundament, uh, it, it's a fundamental reason, is blockchain is something that takes away power from those who currently have it. And of course, a lot of those institutions and stakeholders don't want to give up their power. Therefore, they will be dragging their feet as much as they can, and they'll be opposing it as much as they can. So governments, banks, financial intermediaries, and rentiers are all those who are under threat from a public blockchain. And that's why many of them are trying to fight it as much as they can, even if they say they really like it. Yeah. The irony is that many of those same institutions are either buying up large amounts of cryptocurrency so they to become part of the game, or starting off their own blockchain, whether it's Facebook, which is sort of a, a data silo, or it's JP Morgan, which is starting their own coin. Well, there is a saying, if you cannot kill a revolution, you should become the leader of that revolution. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to do. Certainly, certainly. And speaking of that revolution, tell me what you guys think in terms of governments which are helpful to cryptocurrencies. Which ones do you think, you know, if you were to start a company now, you would try to set up your foundation or your business there? You might bank there. Where are the best regulations uh, in terms of sort of helping adoption? So I think absolutely stay away from the US right now. Um, they just have categorized everything as a security. Everything is taxable. I think Delaware is one of the only places you can go where you get some level of freedom. Europe has been actually surprisingly open. Uh, the UK has the FCA's regulatory sandbox, which allows companies to come and participate without the fear of being sort of penalized by the regulators. And businesses, institutions are respecting that. Um, Germany as well, very, very big, uh, iconic. My company is based out of Germany. Uh, we recently announced that we have tokenized all the company's equity. So we've actually gone to the regulators, we've received all the proper certificates and no action letters that we needed in order to take all the company's equity and grant it to the employees in a tokenized manner on a, registered on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. We're also launching uh, investment funds out of Malta as well. So Europe itself, if you play by the rules and you don't try to be super cavalier, mm -hmm. we'll accept you, we'll have a dialogue with you, and we'll allow you to sort of create really new opportunities. Um, unlike sort of different regions which are still trying to get a grip around whether or not they want to deal with blockchain, with cryptocurrencies, um, based on sort of 
I think, as we said before, sort of, oh, it's this drug money. Right. And so while we're here, why don't we give a point for London here at home. Tell me about the FCA regulatory sandbox. I know you had some experience with that. Uh, I did. It actually was born uh, in the office of my old company. Uh, this was back in 2015. Um, you had quite a few fintech companies, quite a few blockchain companies sort of going around trying to not only create opportunities for, for just regular consumers and retail, but trying to interact with banks, interact with credit card companies and other financial institutions. And every time we went and knocked on the door, it was just slammed in our face. Right. And the main reason for that was, sorry guys, there's no regulatory clarity. We don't even know if we want to, let alone if we can work with you. And that created a huge problem because there was a good product to offer consumers. There was a good offer for businesses. Um, and I, to be honest, can't tell you how. We managed to gather a bunch of startups. Uh, we managed to gather representatives from the Financial Conduct Authority, sat them down, had a chat about what really matters, had a chat about financial innovation, um, and after many months of work, the regulatory sandbox was born. It was amazing. No, what it really is the did allow sandbox? us to start playing around and allow these institutions yeah. as well to internally had an interest in building something in blockchain. They wanted to touch smart contracts. They see the value. The problem is, it's kind of like a Mexican standoff. Sure. You have all of these different uh, actors standing around. Everybody wants to do something, mm -hmm. but everyone is afraid to pull the trigger. Now tell us, what is the regulatory sandbox and how does a London company that wants to do blockchain participate? So, I mean, to be completely fair, it's been a while since I've uh, delved with it. So sure. the state of it, I, I'm aware it still exists. Right. Um, but I think the FCA have bigger things like Brexit to deal with. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. but essentially, Being the kind. regulatory sandbox is a safe harbor for fintech companies and institutions as well to be able to play around with things that normally would be categorized as uh, experimental, yep. such as Bitcoin, yep. for example, in order to do international transactions. Um, this allows them to do so with, with the guidance from the regulator. And they really are, they're not just there to kind of just sort of wag their finger and say, don't sure. do this or don't sure. do that. They really were very, very helpful and insightful in finding safe ways to offer these sort of services to regular consumers and still protect them from sort of things that they just are mandated to protect. KYC for identification, right. Right. AML for money laundering and terrorist funding. Um, so it really was a unique opportunity that by having this certificate and being uh, accepted into this program, you were then able to actually act like any other startup in this conference today does. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going up to, to startups here who aren't in the financial sector and saying, well, hang on, we don't want to deal with you. You know, th th this is risky. I don't want to buy uh, pet food. Sure, sure. Right, over the internet. Um, but the moment you throw some sort of financial... Uh, component into it, there's a lot of question marks that start popping up. And this mm -hmm. really did manage to solve it and it allowed the regulators as well, through these companies, through these partnerships, to learn more about the industry, learn more about the technology and then provide the proper legislation needed in order to make it a standard. Sure. So n when you actually have launched your company, you have it in a compliant fashion running day to day, um, the harder part then is acquisition. A lot of the protocols are fighting over what is about a quarter million blockchain developers at all who are, you know, who are actually building on Solidity. Um, and so adoption for protocols, which is sort of the, the major class of blockchain still, um, is extremely hard. And so I want to ask you, um, Angel, in terms of Ambrosis, what are you guys doing for adoption? Not just in terms of selling it to clients, but in terms of getting uh, developers to build on it, in terms of getting additional investors if you need them, in terms of just getting developers involved as well. Yeah, so one of the first things we did in our ecosystem was to create various tools that would permit developers and entrepreneurs to build new stuff on top of our infrastructure. Uh, we often make an analogy between Ambrosos with a PlayStation, saying that if we are building the PlayStation, we also have to build the first games so that people could play them, people could see how they work, and then others could come along and build and create their own games. In a similar fashion, we at Ambrosos created some apps, some solutions that utilize the blockchain, primarily in the supply chain or smart city management area. And then we've created a lot of different tools, SDKs and APIs that actually enable developers to create stuff easily without knowing how to code on the blockchain. So accessibility is important for us. So on Ambrosos, you can build apps in JavaScript, 
in iOS and Android and C. So some of the most popular programming languages are supported. So this is the first step to create accessibility. Uh, the second step, we do have different incentives for the community members that create something valuable. Uh, there is basically a pool of Amber, Amber that's the cryptocurrency of Ambrosos, so there is a pool of cryptocurrency that is available for various entrepreneurs and teams who create something valuable. Uh, we have a lot of our code is on the GitHub, it's fully open source, so everybody can freely actually fork it and upgrade it. They don't have to do it within our ecosystem necessarily. So all this openness, exclusivity, uh, sorry, inclusivity and provision of the necessary tools for people, I think they are everything that creates a strong community uh, building new stuff around Ambrosos. Then we also do hackathons and other yeah, uh, things yep. to encourage that, but those are practical aspects. Cool, so what I'm hearing is uh, you know, keeping things transparent, building the tooling, creating incentive systems, creating opportunities for people to actually do the building. Now, can you, do you have any examples of folks building on your chain? Any D apps that uh, seem interesting to you that you want to talk about? Yes, yeah, so um, we have, uh, as I've mentioned, so Ambrosos itself specializes at the convergence of blockchain and, I and IoT. So a lot of the use cases we have, they interact with sensors. So one app that we've had a group of entrepreneurs create is a cold chain app. It's an application that basically enables companies and consumers to track their packages and to track their temperature. It's very important for medicine, for many kinds of food, or for other objects where the temperature of storage matters. So it couples the GPS location of the product with temperature, and it provides valuable insights into the data for the stakeholders. Now, for those who might ask why is blockchain needed here, well, it's needed because temperature of storage directly affects quality of food or medicine, and a lot of participants of the supply chain are trying to hide if there is something wrong. If something was not stored properly, people have big incentives to hide it, and the scale of the problem is big. So in the US alone, mislabeling of food products was about $55 billion worth of losses last year. So that's just one country and one segment. So there is a big economic incentive there, and we had a group of entrepreneurs working together with corporates who created that app. We also had some other examples of applications such as loyalty points on the blockchain where you purchase certain items and get loyalty points. And okay, right now there are no markets available, but imagine in the future you could have a crypto exchange where you could trade your Starbucks loyalty points for air miles maybe, right? You've drank a lot of coffee and you're about to fly somewhere and your friend has a bunch of air miles. Right now we can't exchange these things, but what if they were tokens, you could exchange them and discover a lot of value. So there are a lot of apps that we already have in existence and many others exciting concepts that are coming Absolutely. up by entrepreneurs. Yeah, and what I'd like to hear is that there's actual utility here. So I'm gonna finish my questioning with that one and then we'll go over to some of the audience questions. Um, and that is, you know, we have a lot of interesting things coming down the pipeline. We have tokenization being adopted a little bit more. We have non-fungible tokens. We're transitioning to proof of stake on certain blockchains. And I wonder if there's anything that you guys would say is the industry ripe for usage of blockchain. And I think we've seen logistics and I think we've seen, you know, um, pure speculation as use cases. Now let me know if there's any other uh, industry that might benefit from blockchain being implemented. Give me your top one and then we'll switch to audience questions. Top, top one industry to benefit? Top one industry to benefit. It's a tough one because I don't want to say the financial industry, but I really think that is probably where it's going to come. We'll see more about that. Where? There's a, it's a big industry, isn't it? So asset management, actually. Investment. Um, we've seen for nearly 10 years now multiple d d new kinds of crypto and digital assets being produced. We've seen very secure ledgers, um, which let's bear in mind, no, not the ones that are getting hacked, but in fact, the exchanges and sort of those vulnerable points are the ones that end up getting hacked, which can provide a very reliable source of information and tracking, which is relevant for the finance. Um, we, for example, are building out an asset management platform. Um, and the reason for this is because there's a huge interest from investors to enter into this market and put their money and invest into something tangible. They've tried the ICOs, we saw sort of what happened there, it's converted to STOs since. 
uh, a lot of the reasons that went down was because of bad actors and sort of lack of regulation and lack of uh, standards in the industry. And now it's time to sort of correct on that, build out uh, licensed and approved pieces of software that utilize and offer these cryptocurrencies to masses to be able to adopt and then allow in financial inclusion. So that's probably where it is where it started, and it's probably still going to maintain as, as the main selling point mm -hmm. of blockchain until sort of new, new, new features get evolved. Yeah, fair. Angel, what do you think? Well, in our case, uh, of course, the ones we're betting on, we feel that they're the ones that are going to get the most benefits. So uh, right now, what's exciting for me is smart cities. Uh, everybody's talking about IoT and how everything in the world will be, will be interconnected. But we already have a number of precedents where hacking took place. People managed to hijack entire networks of connected devices and so on. So without proper cybersecurity behind IoT, you can't have smart cities. Otherwise, you know, your threat will not come from any terrorist groups with weapons, but from hackers literally paralyzing your city, shutting down energy, stopping your self-driving cars and whatever else they could do. So blockchain is actually so far the strongest element providing security. So this convergence between blockchain and IoT, in my opinion, will truly enable us to create smart cities of the future. That's why I'm so excited about this, and that's why we're working on that particular application. Hell yeah. Now we're going to do one audience question here. Um, in terms of private blockchains like you know, IP, IBM or Hyperledger or something like that, um, will they overtake public blockchains? Why or why not? I think very much like code and open source code, we saw sort of in, in the uh, 90s, we saw sort of the rise of Java, uh, which was a private piece of technology. And we've seen since then how open source technology has just taken over that. So I think the, 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 the ability to adopt public open source blockchains faster than private blockchains probably will lead the way. Um, but it will eventually become a split because there's different use cases to be said for pri private blockchains and for public blockchains. For institutions, for B2B businesses, potentially an IBM solution would make more sense. The seal of approval of IBM alone, that brand, would sort of lead them to trust and close the deal. Um, but public probably will be the one to prevail since if we're truly going global, it's the only way forward. Yeah, agreed. I don't think IBM sticking their label on it makes it uh, de-risked. Um, your thoughts? Um, concerning private blockchains taking over, uh, I think it will depend a lot on education of the public because private blockchains, to me personally, they don't make sense. If it's a private blockchain, then just, you know, don't do blockchain, just do private databases. They already exist, they're very efficient and so on. So we're always trying to explain to companies that, you know, if you want to benefit from the trustless model from the open model and so on, you have to use a public network. Of course, a truly public blockchain does have bottlenecks. It may be slower to upgrade and so on and so on. But at the same time, that's what creates a trustless uh, environment. This is where you have something where you know it's truly immutable because what is blockchain if not the source of the truth? If you no longer can trust in this truth because it's controlled by a single entity or corporations or a government that can delete or change the data, then the whole value proposition of blockchain collapses. So it should not be there. It might steal because, of course, Hyperledger is the most popular choice for governments and for large corporations. But it's because they can control it. You know, they say it's convenient because we can control it. So that's the irony of this all. And yeah, I mean, history has already shown that when the powerful stakeholders want to achieve something, even if it goes against the interests of the society, they can do so. So if there is sufficient push for that, private blockchains can actually overtake it. But they will not be able to break down Bitcoin because people have been trying to kill Bitcoin <laughs> for years. Truth. They never succeeded and they will probably never succeed. Resilient. Let's give our revolutionaries a hand. Thank you so much.